Hello, Dawson. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, welcome to the uh, post-material condition report on art and philosophy, uh, where uh, we will discuss the, the connections between the recent uh, philosophical trends in, uh, 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 in post-humanism, new materialism, and uh, object-oriented philosophy and and new realisms with uh, contemporary art. Uh, we have uh, four guests. Uh, with us here is Bartaku, who is uh, has just arrived from Brussels. He is now with, uh, in the residency with Case Grad uh, as part of the Frontiers in Liquid project, which is also the project uh, to which the, this show materialized. Uh, Bartaku is an artistic researcher inspired by systems thinking and fueled by quests. The research evolves through interventions, installations, the residencies, talks, and labs, very often in collaborative context. Most acclaimed are the temporary photoelectric like digestopians work labs, a series of public labs where people experiment with entanglement of energy, light, food, and body, questioning mankind's eternal struggle for energy. Since 2009, Bartakut has lectured and collaborated intensively with Future Textiles Department of Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design London. He is also a member of Transdisciplinary Lab Forum and co-founder of Artist Collective Rome. Uh, and online, uh, we have three guests joining us through Google Hangouts. Kermare Lafarna Kelmer, uh, an independent curator and researcher based in London. She studied cultural st studies in, in Unibrook. Germany, in Germany and art history at the Cultural Institute of Art in London. She is currently pursuing a PhD while working as curatorial assistant to Stephanie Rosenthal, chief curator of the Biennale Bien of Sydney 2016. Her writings have appeared in Textbooks of Kunst and in other Kulturbisse Schaffische Zeitschrift for Kunst and Medium. Uh, then we have Milos Petrilovic from Berlin. Uh, he lives and works in Berlin, uh, born in the Netherlands. His performative, textual, and land-based work attempts to articulate the position and finitude of the body in relation to the increasing processes of digitization, both on-screen, off-screen, and in between. In his more recent work, he mediates these questions by placing them in the context of post-socialist history and legacies in its cultural and political production. And uh, last speaker is Nina Trivedi, joining us uh, from London. Uh, she is a writer, curator, and a member of the governing board of the International Association for Visual Culture and a part of the editorial group for the Journal of Visual Culture. She holds the BFA from Parsons, the New School of Design, and an MFA from Goldsmiths College, University of London. She is currently a PhD candidate at the Royal College of Art. She uh, taught courses and lectures at the Royal College of Art, Goldsmiths College, and the Camden Art Centre. Her work focuses on the wider social political implications of visual culture and new materialisms. So uh, that's our guest. Uh, so I will try to introduce the, uh, the, the, the theme of the evening. Uh, so the interconnection between these recent philosophical trends and uh, contemporary art production. Um, so. Okay, so um, pretty much all of our political, social, and historical theories were made on another planet and may describe only that other planet, uh, Mackenzie work. Uh, our planet is different now. Carbon dioxide algorithms, drones, hurricanes, bees, polar bears, glaciers, graphic user interfaces, fiber optic cables, they all make things happen, and humans along with them, in the middle of this motley multi multitude. Writing in 1985, Donna Haraway claimed three crucial boundary breakdowns happened in the U.S. NPT culture. Quote, the boundary between human and animal is thoroughly breached. The second legal distinction is between animal and human, organism and machine. And the third shaky distinction, the boundary between physical and non-physical is very imprecise to use. 
Over the last 10 years, but with a longer tradition, various fields of humanities turned towards matter, things, or objects. A brief genealogy may go like this. Um, Anti-humanism, uh, which in Foucault was one of the main figures. Social analysis, which takes into account what bodies do. Followed by the philosophy of immanence of Deleuze and Gattari, uh, which thinks animals, matter, lives, and earth. Science and technology studies in the 1980s and 1990s analyzed scientific procedures in terms of construction of reality, not taking for granted matter, neither what is social nor the world of matter. Post-humanism, which looks at contaminations between human and animal, vegetal, non-organic and technological bodies. Speculative realism, or new realism, which attempts to break with what they call correlation between subject and the world, and the world whereby it is impossible to think outside of the human subject. From here we have object-oriented philosophy, uh, which treats the whole of reality as a, a spiraling interplay of objects wrapped in objects wrapped in objects. Uh, then uh, feminist materialisms, which go beyond the assertions of postmodern theory that gender is a social construction and turn attention towards the body. Uh, and finally, uh, new materialism or neo-materialism, uh, both a cultural theory that does not privilege the side of culture, but also focuses on what Donna Haraway would call nature culture, or referred to as collectives. Um, these parallel and often intersecting movements of thought created what is now called ontological term or post human term in the cultural theory. But they are also making profound impact in the visual arts, where an increasing number of curators, artists, and authors turn their attention towards these trends of thought and use them creatively. So uh, I will now introduce uh, some of the main topics that new materialisms bring uh, to, to art, and um, then we will hear uh, presentations, uh, single presentations by Bartaku or by Mara, then Milos and Nina, and then we will open for our discussion. Um, so these are some of the key terms I think that new materialisms have put in question uh, uh, as a kind of um, some of the key modern terms that new materialisms are radically questioning. So, uh, subject. Uh, the post-human subject is a transversal entity fully immersed in and immanent to a network of non-human, animal, vegetable, viral relations. The zoe-centered embodied subject is shot through with relational linkages of the contaminating viral kind, which interconnected to the variety of others, starting from the environmental or echo others, and including the technological apparatus. That's a great answer. Um, our bodies are assembly, assembly, assemblies of organic and non-organic agents. We are walking the talking minerals, uh, like we not to. The question of agency. Uh, in, from new materials perspective, power to act is not human only. It is distributed among the myriad of entities, biotic and abiotic, animal, vegetal, mineral, technological. Quote, uh, all entities have consequences. Grass can do things in the world, just as atoms and Popeye can do things, uh, Bruno Tour. Uh, but, uh, quote from Jane Bennett, can non-organic bodies also have a life? Is there such a thing as a mineral or metallic life, or the life of the it in its reins? Lives without minds or minds without lives? The, uh, the question of difference. Uh, humans are perhaps not the pinnacle of evolution anymore. What if all entities were on equal footing and that no entity, whether artificial or natural, symbolic or physical, possessed greater ontological dignity than other objects? Um, this was a quote from Larry Bryant. Uh, in this formulation, um, this does not amount that everything is the same. Quite the contrary, every single thing is different. Each object is a unique, singular individual, differing from all others in its own special way. To be is to make or produce difference. Bryant again. The question of subject-object relation. Uh, new materialisms call on us to give up on all, all, on all the ideas of action upon an external reality, upon a humanist subject which acts upon uh, something which is outside. Torren Barad names this modern engagement, uh, calls this modern engagement uh, intra, intra action. There are no, no pre existing subjects or objects before relation. 
only through interaction, the boundaries and properties of the components of phenomena become determined. Uh, this notion of interaction means that uh, we are inseparable or entangled with others. We cannot know or even be without interacting with others. Uh, world. Uh, since each entity is a unique singular individual, the world or the universe does not exist. What looms now is a pluriverse or heteroverse, a multitude of ways by which individual entities engage with the world. Each entity makes a whole world for itself. Smartphones do stuff on their own. Cameras have their own reality. Even a snowflake has one. Yet, somehow, these universes interact. There is some sort of mediation, translation, association, misunderstanding, complicity. Information or affect is a common feature of this universe or pluriverse. And humans are not the only ones coding and decoding. Specifically, there is a blurring of the line between nature and culture, and we are always hybrids of natures and cultures, of signs and matter or flesh. Timothy Morton emphatically claims that we are now after the end of the world, uh, where he insists that the world has ended that single world of philosophy where reason only had access to some sort of objective reality out there. This was the world of moderns, of the mastery of humans over matter, therefore perhaps we should not cry too much about it. Aesthetics is part of this history too, and it was a complex, a complex sometimes and sometimes a critique of, the, of this colonization of the world, but by other means, through representation or visualization. Sometimes aesthetics recreated subjects and objects, foregrounds and backgrounds, and what matters and what does not. Uh, what if we are now in this other, more than human universe, in this flat ontology, uh, where all objects equally exist while they, while they do not exist equally? What happens to politics and aesthetics when the state is as real as a thread of wool, where a piece of coat is as real as a mountain? They are, of course, radically different, but they create a worlding together, entanglements of mind and matter, energy and objects, signs and bodies. Uh, what kind of art are we able to make, with whom, and for whom, in a world where matter comes to matter? How to stay true to a reality where even imperceptible things make difference, a post-human reality where there is no definite background and therefore no definite foreground? Now I will pass the word to Bartaku. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For sure. So it's on. Yeah. Okay. So Bartaku. based in Brussels on the move to uh, live in Helsinki for the next four years. Um, I was asked by Nico to talk a bit about my work, um, but I would like to start with some taste in my mouth that I have as an ex, I think it is because I'm an ex social scientist. Um, the taste in my mouth is related to the word or the container new materialism. And especially the word new um, gives me a bit of a strange uh, taste. And this taste brings me back to some um, all the work that I did in collaboration with uh, another Belgian artist, Professor Farage, and in collaboration with a weaving community and high up in the Andes in Peru. Um, this was an installation, a tactile media installation, as I call it, with expensive works that consisted of 
threats, textile threats that we made according to our own code, uh, in collaboration with uh, the people from Andes, um, and that in sound into them so that when people were walking into the installation, they had to take actually the, the coded wires, bring them to their ears to be able to listen what was in um, the audio. And the audio consisted of a selection of 700 hours of um, recordings that I made when I was traveling for a year aimlessly in Latin America. Uh, this is 2004. Most importantly, this installation was based um, upon my fascination for um, the Inca society that in a very short time was capable of expanding in uh, South America up to 4,000 kilometers. And why was this? Predominantly because they had an information system that consisted of a seven-bit binary, a 3D-dimensional, spatialized uh, threat um, content installation, basically. I will show you because I like to So what the Incas did was uh, train people in the Information Academy to score the capital of the Sun Empire of uh, the Incas. And these people were trained to encode still important information. How many families are there in the parts of the empire? How many children? And male, female, and mice do we have? Weapons, uh, but also which type of stories do we have? Imagined stories. So quantitative and qualitative data was stored in these threads. So you have a main horizontal thread, and then vertical threads were connected to them, hanging like this. And every thread had a specific color. Um, it was called um, rainbow or non-rainbow colors, so already a binary precision. And they had a decimal system of knots referring to quantitative information. So a single eight knot was 10, second one was in the 20s, and up to whatever number they needed. Um, the Incas also, as opposed to the Europeans, had the concept of zero. We were still too much with our head into Christianity to be able to acknowledge the concept of zero. Um, so you have to imagine that every day in Cusco, hundreds of these bookkeepers run down according to the constellation of the stars, they run down to various parts of the empire to record state important information on these facts. But then it was then they confirmed, for example, a month of state important information is compressed this into a small ball of wool. And it was given to runners, young guys, 18 years old, who had to run for the thing that we need. And they had to run, but it was like a best of sets. So then the rule, the bookie would give some information to the first runner. He runs two kilometers up into the mountains. There's a little way to post the clothes and the food. He gives it to the next one. And this way, up to 600 kilometers in one day, this information in one month can go the ruling elite of the Incas. And there, of course, was a guy who de decoded the information, explaining it to the rulers, and based upon that, they took the state important measures. Now, for the Incas, they had a holistic, non dualistic uh, cosmovision. They, they were convinced that matter was vibrant, they were convinced that threats were a medium that was vibrant. They organized the whole empire, they worked on the mountains, having respect for water, rocks, and understanding it deeply to be able to have what we today would call a permaculture-based uh, agriculture system that still today, in some parts, do exist. So this is um, an original, what is called people. So this is an all-state information Coded into these single threads. Uh, the Spanish, when they took over um, the Inca Empire, they immediately understood that these devices, this technology, was very important. So they tried to burn as much as they could. So today, 600 of these so called kibbutz are kept. Uh, this one is in Sweden. And there's a database online that you can, where you can sort everything out. But the code, the real code, is lost, especially for the non quantitative uh, to qualitative information. This code is lost. So we took this loss as a a gateway for freedom for our, for our own installation to develop new codes. 
after his physician interventions, uh, physician openings, further discovering the, the vibrant and energetic aspects of threats, of wires, um, connecting them to people um, unexpected, uh, unexpectedly to their ears, to their clothes, and then from two meters we started drilling and created all these aesthetical wind up weird wires. So, this is our interested agriculture terrace based in the mountain with very smart management of water. Um, like before 5, 1500, they started doing this, and still today it's happening like that. Um, so, the rocks, as I said, rocks, they had the revival out of them. They were vibrant, they were alive, um, and they handled them with big respect. And it's still a mystery how they built their houses. Because they did not use any cement to make their earthquake resistant buildings. No, they made the rocks gigantic rocks so that they would fit immediately on top of one another with a lot of carving and so yeah, it's a little bit of a, of a mystery. So I would like to go from the Andes now to the Balkan, the Balkan Mountains, where since uh, the beginning of the industrial era, I think we're trying with some um, new machines or industrial machines, we're trying to make the Balkan Mountains a bit higher. Okay. Like we're doing this in Bors, for example, making the mountains go a bit deeper so that they are a bit higher using these uh, machines. I heard about this for the first time two years ago when Frontiers and Retreats uh, had an opening session here in Dasi Grad. And we were talking about Bors and how these mining trucks are used um, also as a monumental device. Um, I got somehow a bit of a hunch that this interests me, uh, especially because our relation to these sublime pieces of architecture there they're ugly, they're polluting, they're dangerous, but at the same time, they fascinate us. We are, yeah, we, it's a lot of relationship, at least for me. Um, so I got somehow interested in these, um, these machines, these devices that are still operated mainly by humans, but soon, first uh, trucks are made by Siemens. Soon they will be replaced by monuments, by technology, by wireless operating uh, distance control. So humans on a flat screen from a distance controlling these trucks. So our physical or our embodied understanding of these machines will get lost to some extent. We even seemingly going evolving towards some type of machine going you know, you know from some animal movies. So, yeah, I'm here the next month to find out how I could transform this truck into a single wire. So, I will develop some speculative work, I will do some experimentations, I will do some visits, field visits, uh, to see what it means a deep antenna with this truck. I would love to have my driver's license for this truck in two days, so and that they will allow me to drive the truck around in the mine. I hope they will allow me to do some rituals in the back of the truck to understand its physical properties a bit better. So I will untangle as much as possible with this piece of technology. The piece of technology that also only I think by untangling with it we will understand what the morality of this piece of technology might be. Between now and the first work that I showed in 2004, I have been doing some research uh, on the relation between light, electrical energy, and the human body. And in retrospect, I think I started doing this in order to be able to comment on where we are now as, as a species in relation to energy. So I started to get my hands on as much as possible on what is called uh, solar technology, like all kinds of technologies that allow light to be converted into the electrical energy. Uh, making it at home, uh, understanding how this works, especially being interested in how organic solar cell devices operate using natural pigments, like the, the darkest juices that you, that you drink, fresh ones, they are the best ones to convert light into electricity. 
So I went from simple recipes to a bit more complicated with a glass artist in Mexico that I started working with, developing as much as possible the poetic aspects of solar technology, ending up in a jewelry piece type of solar cells, you can see here. Uh, most of these ones are working with hibiscus juice. Um, there's copper, of course, involved in this book. Um, there's some silver gold, titanium dioxide, and the salt solution as a carbon. Um, after having had some zeolite, I might try now with zeolite as well. But I want to go more radically into leaky loop system thinking which meant that I had to find replacement materials for the non, uh, let's say, digestible materials. So I had to find edible components for the non-edible existing solar cell technologies. I wanted to go as far as possible to this idea that our body could take in the leftover electrical energy when the solar cells were having had, having had their, their work. What would happen then with the leftover energy in our body? And then we would, of course, get rid of it. Get rid of it, put it back in the system, and new plants would grow, get new juices, and the system could start all over. I didn't call it a closed loop system, but as I said, a leaky loop system thinking kind of thing. So I, did, I developed this in many contexts, uh, collaborative labs, uh, often in, in collaboration with Santos Jose Martins, the textile people, because they are very good in, in intimate work with uh, materials. So I could get as deep as possible into entanglement um, together with them. And in the end, it was always a, a picture taken when people I invited people to stick out their tongue to the sun, put the edible solar cells on the tongue, and then have a test moment. And there was always a transformation, of course, in the face of the people who were either afraid or very happy or curious. Uh, and at the same time, transformation of light into electricity. Next month, I will develop this concept further, trying to comment on neuroaesthetic uh, theories, connecting the output of the solar cells to parts of the brain so that we might think that we have made the most important, important artwork in the history of man. This was the first edible solar panel made in Santa St. Martins. Most important component of the solar cells, the juice. The pigment that works the best in converting light into electricity is the aronia berry. That also comes from America, but a bit higher, not from the Andes, but from North America. And since 2009, I am getting more and more involved, engaged, and tangled with this berry. Uh, every month in September, I go to a plantation in Latvia to somehow connect with the berry as much as possible. And uh, yeah, my next years of work will try to bring this work uh, more and more on a deeper level, up to the extent that I will try to have the pigment of the berry deeply interact, or interact, um, if I have to step more in the series, interact with my uh, skin pigments, so that in an uncontrollable way, the new shape of the berry that I'm trying to develop will emerge and uh, will appear on my um, humble human body. Other aspects of the berry, its uh, metabolistic properties, we try to express using as, as non-human voices as possible. So uh, we trained people in various cities in Europe to try to find in them non-human voices as much as possible, to be able to use a human body as uh, a medium, to an agent to express the essence of the berry. And we also developed uh, an audio machine that was a summary um, of the metabolistic properties of the berry, and you juxtapose both the choir, the unchoir, we call it, the unchoir and the machine in various performances. And now there are, as I said, um, I got a signal of the berry that it doesn't like its scientific name, Aronia Melanocarpa. So I got on the plantation, I got some signal that a new name has to be found for the berry, and it became Baroa de la Obara, it would be the new name for the berry. So I'm working at that with some official boring scientific institutes. But that means that the old name did not have a very anymore to refer to. So that's why I'm working now on a new future shape of a new berry type. And 
these things are now happening in the lab in Riga, the first uh, steps. Right, that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Guys, um, okay. So next speaker is uh, Mara Yukanakyan from London. Uh -huh. Just uh, give me a second. Uh, uh -huh. <coughs> Great. Good evening. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's a really great pleasure to speak today from London at Grad in Belgrade and appear on this amazing screen as a composition of ones and zeros. I'm becoming one with the pixel, so to say. Which really brings me to the topic I want to speak about today, a topic that I have been concerned with since my MA at the Courted Institute of Art in London, and that I'm now pursuing in a PhD. I would like to address immaterial matters and talk about art between the corporeal and the digital. This will be a quite brief and condensed uh, 20 minutes presentation, so please bear with me and don't hesitate to ask any question afterwards if things seem unclear to you. A very big thank you to Mirko, which will change my, who will sli um, change my slides. Um, and now we can have the second slide, please. Thank you. Sometime in the late 1920s and Early, on early 1930s of the last century, Antonio Gramsci recorded in one of the many notebooks he filled during his long incarceration in the Turi prison, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Gramsci attached the concept of interregnum to a situation in which the accent order loses its grip and can hold no longer, whereas a new frame is still at the designing stage, has not yet been fully assembled. I propose, as many other, others have suggested before me, to recognize the present day planetary condition as a case of interregnum, and this meeting tonight as a form of a static think tank for exploring, imagining, and thus potentially shaping our condition of possibility through an engagement with visual art. Times of interregnum are times of uncertainty, and these times suggest, as Mirko has outlined, a departure from existing concepts under the pressure of multiple political, social, environmental crises that define our contemporary realities. While this raises many questions, I would like to focus mine on visual art by wondering how we can think with and through art about the issue that define our contemporary. In my research, situated at the crossroads of art history, digital technology and philosophy, I aim to theorize the comprehensive impact of the digital on artistic materials and body representations within the work of young artists. With the following slide, I would like to in introduce to you selected works of Alisa Barenboim, an artist based in New York, and Alice Jenner from London. Their works, as I, like, as I would like to argue, are representative of a moment of transition in contemporary art that is leading towards a novel conceptualization of materiality and corporality. This shift is, in my opinion, symptomatic for a generation of artists that have been significantly influenced by the digital. Alisa Barenboim and Alice Chenner use digital technologies as means of artistic production, as material resource, and as bronze for reflections on technology's impact on the human and non-human body. In the next slide, you will see Alisa Barenboim's 
hybrid sculptures designed in Adobe Photoshop. Here, hand-molded flash color ceramic pieces meet USB cables, gelled emollients, penetrator hard drive, and silk bonds with digital photography. Next slide, please. The encounter between hardware and software in her works is consistent with a material encounter between the anthropomorphic and the artificial, the human and the technoid, the physical and the digital. This inter intermediate zone between mechanics and organics serves as an abstracted image of the human body, penetrated by technology and by industrial products. The dissolving boundaries between the organic and the mechanistic, flesh and technology, subject and object, are also approached in the practice of Alice Jenner. The subsequent slide shows that Jenner materializes distorted representations of human bodies captured by digital photography, 3D scanned or modified in Photoshop in inanimate materials such as chrome, stainless steel, aluminium or bronze. Next slide, please. Jenner's works, which compromises abstracted images of human spines, hair and fingers, is concerned with the disappearance and mutations of bodies in a virtually informed society. Next slide, please. Barenboim and Jenner for the tangible space between the physical and the digital, drawing lively connections between materiality and immateriality. Their works point toward an embodiment of the digital, which I understand as both immaterial and at the same time solidly material. Within the discourses of sculpture, these artists thus prompt us to reconceptualize the relationship between the digital and the physical between materiality and immateriality. In their works, the non-human body is represented as fragmented. Materials that are organic and inorganic, industry produced and handcrafted and set in a relation to a digitized universe outline corporeality. Next slide, please. Barenboim's and Chenna's anthropomorphic sculptures emphasize the human body as liquidity and thus underline a concept of the body that transgresses a formal logic which depends on the distinctions of categorical oppositions like inside and outside, figure and ground, male, female, living, dead. Barenboim uses amorphous and form-changing gelled emollients, the mineral oils of which penetrate hard handcuffed ceramic impressions of industrial produced goods combined with the tactility of digitally printed silk. This initiates a lively interplay between interiority and exteriority. A glance at her technoid installation is reminiscent of a glimpse into the interior of a non-human body without clearly defined boundaries. As the following slide shows, Jenna's works Play also play with bodily scale, the dissolution of hierarchies and the physical state of materials, implying a sense of being between liquid and solid form. While radically stretched digital prints on flowing crepe de chine make references to hair, aluminium casts allude to the human spine. Amplified by the titles of her works, such as organics, cold metal body or soft shell, the resemblance to a living circulatory system coalesces with a truly inanimate and dead dramaturgy. Next slide, please. One could also say that Barenboim's and Shanna's formless works suggest an image of the body that is not bound to concrete or materialized form. Considering their post-industrial and digitized surroundings, the human scale has been relinquished in favor of states of aggregations, a modular commodity, a cultural artifact. In Jenner and Barenbaum's works, 
Identity emerges from interplay of surfaces and aggregations, the exteriorization of all interiority. This physical condition of their objects calls into question today's digital infused realities, where hybrid states of being coexist but are equally dispersed. Their works dissolve binary oppositions between subject and object. Their understanding of corporality and immateriality is evocative of the point of departure of the 95 exhibition Les Immatériaux at the Centre Georges Pompidou. Its creators, French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard and Thierry Chaput formulated the idea for the exhibition as a question as visible on the next slide. Do immaterials, which in its contradiction denotes a material which is not matter for a project, leave the relationship between human beings and material unaltered or not? This relationship being understood as it has been fixed in a tradition of modernity, for example by the Cartesian program of becoming the master and processor of nature. In this light, it is important to emphasize that the exhibition Les Immateriaux questioned the division between mind and matter as modernity's central figure of thought. This was based on post-war developments of new materials, new media, new ways of telecommunication and informatics. With the concept of immaterials, Lyotard argued that the relationship between man and material and especially her self-conception would alter to the extent that technology would be able to reassume the abilities of the logos by storing and processing dematerialized data. In light of this increasing penetration of mind and matter, Lyotard's neologism, Les Immateriaux, expressed that the immaterial could no longer be viewed as an inert object opposing an intelligent subject, but instead now as cousins in the family of immaterials. Next slide, please. Presenting this condition as a state of unease and as ray, the immaterials should desensitize the visitors to this development determined by the dissolution of the concept of matter as a solid building material of reality. For Lyotard, digitization would introduce a final level of abstraction into the, this process by imposing a finite scheme of encoding that replaced matter with the language of an abstract universal code, the digital code, a code without an analogy to its origin. Compared to modernity, the postmodern condition was mediated by complex machines. It does describe a new complexity that would also interfere with the identity of man. Lyotard concluded that along with the dematerialization of matter, man would experience his own dissolution. The complexity of Lyotard's ambitious exhibition project disclosed the horizon that largely defines today's internetworked society. This is also mirrored in the concerns of Elisa Barenboim and Jenna Sculptures. Their concern could be articulated as follows. Where there is what Lyotard and others call a translation of things into signs, the increasing dematerialization of all material and thus a triumph of semiology over materiality, what room is left for the corporeal? Next slide, please. Barenboim's and Chenna's return to materiality that is informed by the immaterial can thus be read as an attempt to research corporeality in our networked times and to bring it back into the occasion. Their sculptures suggest a far more bodily dimension. Their works go beyond mystifications of the digital as immaterial, which is mirrored in debates surrounding new media art and digital art discourses. Their sculptures assign the same weight to the material and the immaterial, the physical and the digital, the idea and the object, and the form and the content. 
acknowledging the material history of the employed artistic media and the networks they exist within. However, Baron Boehm and Janet's work seem to mirror a state of crisis and fragmentation in terms of both the artist and the aesthetic object. Where does the subject in these works end? Where does the object begin? Where exactly is the interface between subject and object? Here, an altered subject-object relationship manifests, reminding us of Lyotard's future vision formulated as a question at the core of Les Materiaux. On one hand, this is mirror than the aesthetic features. Their blurring of clear boundaries between bodies, objects, and context emphasizes a conflation of subject and object. Here, they rather seem to be indistinguishable as opposed to being two separate entities. The solution of subject and object is also mirrored in terms of their production process, which always grants the employed materials and technologies a certain autonomy. Barenboim cannot control the interaction between the handcrafted ceramic forms and the industrially produced gelled emollients in leakage industry. The outcome of Jenna's 3D scanned printed finger is determined by the natural properties and failures of these technologies. It thus makes them animate resources with logic of their own, as Barenboim points out. In these works, materiality is active, self-creative, productive, and unpredictable. The employed materials and digital technologies possessing a multitude of industrial histories and agencies thus consciously reflect and disturb the conventional sense that the agent is exclusively human. This also affects the topic of authorship, making the artist only one of many authors, as Jenner observes. In this regard, the author, like his employed material, is both subject and object, or rather, as much object as are his works. Conceiving the works by Barenboim and Jenner as sentient entities with lives of their own, I refuse to append philosophical theories to their works unconsciously by just asking the open question, could the materiality in these works be something more than more matter, as emphasized in the writings of new materialist thinkers such as Jane Bennett or speculative realists like Graham Harmon? The gesture of object-oriented art is one that does not allow for the networked and impersonal world to remain the eternally excluded other of human existence, but makes it into something art can potentially question, explore, situate, and revise. The material inquiries by Barenboim and Jenner indeed possess such a dialogical quality symptomatic for our digitally infused realities. This contemporary moment is mirrored in the immateriality of their sculptures, fusing handmade with industrially produced, synthetic with organic, animate with inanimate, and material with immaterial. For what binds these works is a materiality created solely through the digital mediation of all eras of production. The digital has become a significant component of their material formation without, however, making them immaterials, as defined by Lyotard. What he described as the immaterializing logic of coding experiences here its very tangible incarnation. What is then at the forefront of these works is not primarily the idea of technological progress leading to the vision of the dematerialization of all material. Quite the opposite. It is the material rebound of a dematerialized future vision. Here, the material is not merely support of the artist's message, but becomes the message once again. Maybe these works could just be seen as, a re as part of a report on a post-immaterial condition, as this symposium suggests. Their materiality and depicted corporeality not only points out that the trope of the digital has as immaterial has come into crisis, but with it our subject-object relations. This novel, Post-Immaterial Condition, 
evolving around new notions of materiality and corporeality may foreshadow a paradigm shift. Along with contemporary philosophy, these works may usher in a new ontology where the human subject loses its anthropocentric position in the world. It becomes an object among other objects in a wide network made of human and non-human agents. The works by Barenboim and Schenner, but also by Mirko and Milos, may be a mise-en-scene of that intermediate zone, the moment of interregnum between digital and corporeal, between human and post-human, and between subject and object. They thereby open up artistic sites in which we can negotiate this dawning ontology. In making us experience a moment of crisis, these artists help us to understand our world and bodies as contingent and about to be altered. Or in the words of Hito Style, the hero is dead, long live the thing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mara. Uh, okay, uh, we will proceed now <coughs> uh, to the next presentation. So we've got uh, Milan Stratilovic uh, from Berlin. Um, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Prije svega, veliki pozdrav svima u Beogradu. Da se čujemo. Halo. Yeah, you can start. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so hello to everyone in Belgrade. Thank you, Mirko, for the invitation. Uh, I hope uh, you guys can hear me because uh, I would like to start by sharing actually some uh, snippets of a work that is very much in progress and it is more of a uh, a little bit of, of fragments of something I was uh, thinking of so bear with me as I continue. So I would like to share with you a few of these fragments uh, of a journey that I took uh, in March in 2015. Uh, so bear with me as I shamelessly edit many sources and dimensions that form my stream of thought here. For purposes of recreating this journey uh, with you right here and now, we could actually travel from several points of departure and by numerous axes. So why don't we literally start right here with this image that you see, this desktop display of uh, Apple's new operating system, Yosemite, and its emblematic default wallpaper of a mountainous national park, which by lucky coincidence is exactly what I really want to discuss here with you, namely mountains. On the 24th of March last year, I boarded on a German wings flight from Sarajevo to Cologne airport. And somewhere amid my journey, halfway between the point of departure and point of arrival, I got captivated by an extensive view onto the mountain range of the Swiss Italian Alps. Although there seems to be no clear definition of a mountain, we could largely agree that it is defined through its material compound. Perhaps it is even rightful to claim that it counts as the largest chunk of matter you are able to perceive instantaneously. And now I would like uh, to ask Mirko to play the video as I continue this uh, talk. So it's overpowering and humbling presence of a mountain has sparked many journeys of ascent and conquer throughout history. Perhaps most notably, the mountain was climbed in the search for answers or in quest of some sort of enlightenment. The history of uh, light bearers, world class illuminated, coming and descending down the mountain is ongoing. Socrates, Moses, Zarathustra, Rousseau, and Nietzsche. I hope we have the video uh, at this point because I would like to refer to it. I think it's 
as I see, I think it should be playing. So uh, as I hovered above the pinnacles of these Alps that I mentioned, I got reminded of one of these journeys partaken a long time ago by the Italian scholar Francesco Petrarca. On April 26, 1336, with his brother and two servants, Petrarca climbed the top of Mont Ventoux, a feat which he undertook for recreation rather than necessity. It was, of course, no great feat, but he was the first recorded alpinist of modern times, the first man to climb a mountain merely for the delight of looking from its top. Petrarca is also traditionally acquainted with the beginning of humanism and is considered by many to be the father of the Renaissance. As this particular journey sparked the response to turn from the outer world of nature to the inner world of the soul. As he descended, descended from uh, the mountain, Mont Ventoux, he rose. And men go about to wander at the heights of the mountains and the mighty waves of the sea and the wide sweep of the rivers and the circuit of the ocean and even the revolution of the stars, but themselves they consider not. So as I continued circling the tops of these mountains that you can see here, I had to consider their meaning in creating borders, which reminded me of Etienne Balibar's observation that borders are often formidable reducers of complexity. I questioned why people belong to country rather than country to people, and how cultural ideology is materialized precisely through the body and such relations to the land. Perhaps what speaks more indisputably lies in the very light, or shall I say dark, of more recent tragic events. The rising number of death tolls, desperate migrants in capsized ships attempting to pull over mountains, bodies of hundreds washing onto the shores and slamming and splintering onto the promontories of this fortress called Europe. Or Mount Sinjar, where thousands of Yazidis got stranded as they sought refuge in its heights, while burned by the sun and blistered by thirst, as IS forces shelled the nearby Christian towns in August last year. I contemplated on the strategic use of mountains, for example, in warfare, the Gebirgsjäger, those infantries of mountain troops and bodies that are especially trained and casted to compete with such relentless peaks and terrains. Or the Olympic mountains surrounding Sarajevo, which was my very point of departure, whose graceful heights served as a main strategic point in the siege of the cities during the 1990s. The analogy could even be drawn more literally as we consider the correlating components of a mountain to those of a lung. For example, they both have a base, they both have fissures, and they both have an apex. Yet how is it that mountains are never prone to collapse, while a lung, for example, collapses spontaneously all the time? Bodies collapse. Ideologies collapse. Socialism collapsed. The Iron Curtain collapsed. Concrete walls collapsed. And this moment right here, right now, would collapse if it wasn't for a desperately stitch, stitched up logics of an advanced capitalism. Don't we ever learn that all systems just tower to eventually collapse? To go back to the human, if for centuries hordes of us from all corners of the world would continuously pile up on one another, our bodies wouldn't even be able to compete with the most modest of mountains and their heights. So there I was, as you can see, so close to the sun and safely shielded by this aluminium cast that prevented me from sharing the same fate as that of Icarus. As I continued contemplating, even in perplexity, on the technology that allowed for this drift above enlightenment, technologies, digital environments, and their material implications onto the human body. This is perhaps somehow the meaning of the Anthropocene, that the future of the human and material world is now totally entwined. After all, it was on the peak of a mountain that Nietzsche declared the death of God. 
And just as then the category of man collapsed once there is no God, so too the category of the social collapses when there is no environment. The material world then is laced with traces of the human. And the human turns out to be made of nothing much besides display, displaced flows of this or that element or molecule. So for the sake of chasing time here, I will have to fast forward a bit and acknowledge the question, but how does this stand in relation to art, or uh, what does it have to do with art? Allow me to pull an old rabbit out of the hat, which nonetheless doesn't fail to illustrate uh, maybe the point that I'm trying to make here. As the famous grandmother of performance art, Marina Abramovic, so seductively proclaimed, I need to be like Mountain, referring to her role in the 2010 famed performance piece, The Artist is Present. Yes, here maybe the artist was indeed present, like a mountain. But the artist was performing. And the body was a mediation that materialized an otherwise immaterial force. Since art as such precedes matter and materiality, and art in itself is in essence non-apparent and disappearing, to borrow on Jean-Luc Nancy's thoughts here. So I prepared for landing. And upon my arrival, I was awaited by a deafening silence on the Cologne airport. The news about a crashed fellow German Wings flight 9525 has spread rapidly. 150 people were killed momentarily as the plane ascended and crashed straight into the French Alps, some three kilometers away from the, from the French settlement Le Verne. This was at the same point that I was also flying over uh, this mountain range that you saw. So as the news unraveled, the claims that the crash was deliberately caused by the co-pilot Andreas Lubitz became ever more plausible. In the days to come, I could not help but draw the striking parallels and the apparent proximity between Mont Ventoux, the one that Francesco Petrarca climbed, and Le Verne, where the plane crashed. At a mere 300 kilometers distance from one another, it is practically at the same site where we could say that humanism was born and where it now got shredded into pieces as a plane with 150 people on board under deliberate course crashed straight into that mountain. Does this mark some definite beginning of a certain post-humanism? Is it rightful to consider that somewhere along the humanist values mentioned by Petrarca, something must have gone terribly askew some sort of major glitch in the values of the man now supposedly facing soul inwards must have occurred. Maybe what we have found centuries after Petrarca's dark ages could only be summed up as an even darker and intolerable suffering, a depression of a single but felt by many that apparently caused the change in course of that fateful flight. Perhaps it is time to now, more than ever, consider the mighty waves of the sea and the wide sweep of rivers and the circuit of that ocean and the revolution of those stars. To stand in awe by the formidable presence of these seemingly static, impermeable chunks of matter. To always be in motion. There is no choice, even for the mountain. The mountain that filters air and sun, water, sound waves, radiation, stars, and you and me and everything else all at once. Thank you. Thank you, Milos. Yes, thanks. Uh, Sorry, I'm using mic, but yeah, you got the applause. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, now uh, we'll pass on to um, uh, Nina Civelli from London. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you can. Uh, okay. 
Uh, we are set to go. Let's start. Okay, so um, what I am working on, or what I wanted to talk about today, is a little bit of the postdoc research that I'm doing. Um, my postdoc is going to be looking at different types of theoretical physics and the relationship that they have to new materialist thinking and to the Internet of Things. Um, so what I wanted to do was sort of just give um, a beginning foundation or idea about why I think there's a relationship with physics and these wider materialist theories. And then at the end, I wanted to bring um, two artists' uh, work to light. One of them is Pamela Rosencrantz, and the other is Magli Royce. Um, so I'll have some images of their work at the end um, and sort of just talk about the material aspects of that work in relationship to some of these wider theories. Um, so the thing about physics or science that really intrigues me the most is to find the most fundamental basis for everything is at the core of physics. So rather than try to massage a theory or make a theory prettier, why not find out why it works or what makes it tick? And I think that, in a way, is what all of us here today are trying to do and what a lot of different curators and artists and writers are trying to do with these realist and materialist philosophies. So realism is said to be based on the idea that the world is independent of our beliefs and desires about it. And materialism relates to the view that all exists in matter, material forces, and physical processes. James Ladyman, in his recent um, article, or rather essay for the book, Realism's Materialism's Art, that was put out by Sternberg Press last year, says that physics is the ultimate science of matter. So here, um, I think there's a really strong connection with how physics, um, especially theoretical physics, can look down to the very, very core notions of matter and antimatter. And I think there's a really strong connection, an interesting connection that can be made there with these new materialist philosophies. So we can see that there are fluctuating boundaries between realism, materialism, and sciences. And Ladyman positions realism and materialism in a world of global or universal scale, ever more accessible thanks to the scientific and technical innovations, while growing less tangible at the same time. Or in philosophical terms, um, realisms and materialisms have in common, what they have in common is an escape from what the philosopher Quentin Malassieu in his book After Finitude described as correlationism, which is the idea according to which we only have access to the correlation between thinking and being and never to either term considered apart from each other. Um, so, Essentially, physics is at the very foundation of matter and energy. And if we have the next slide, these are the four kind of main aspects or forces that you find in physics. There's gravity, there's a strong and weak force, a nuclear force, and then there's electromagneticism. Um, and I'm just sort of going to quickly break down the fundamental aspects of these forces and the political ramifications that they've had historically. So I think it's also important when we think about the Anthropocene, when we think about deep time, I think a lot of the recent writing has um, focused on the politics of the Anthropocene. And I think it's really interesting to look at some of these scientific discoveries and see the political, social ramifications of them. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. Thanks. So to paraphrase Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from divinity. Um, and here's where I just want to go back um, to the history of physics, essentially. Right? So back in the Middle Ages, um, if we have the next slide. Thanks. Uh, for example, people read the works of Aristotle, and Aristotle asked the question, why do objects move toward the Earth? And that's because he said objects yearn yearn to be united with the Earth. And why do objects slow down when you put them in motion? Objects in motion slow down because they get tired. And these are the works of Aristotle, which sort of held sway for almost 2,000 years until the beginning of modern physics with Galileo and Newton. Um, and if we have the next slide, here's what I think is the most, and other physicians, uh, rather physicists think is the most important book um, in history is Principia, which is um, some 
all of the calculus and all of the maths that Newton did in the 1600s, which still holds true today. So anytime there's rockets launched, it's still by the actual maths and formulas that are in this book. And what Newton did was he not only set into motion the ability to calculate planets, he also set into motion a mechanics. Machines now operated upon well-defined laws. And Newton's second law of motion says force is mass times acceleration. So if we have the next slide. Right. So this equation made possible the Industrial Revolution. Steam engines, factories, machines, all of it due to the me mechanics set into motion by Newton's second law of motion, which is, as you see here, force is equal to mass times acceleration. So the lesson here is when scientists unravel the first force of the universe, gravity, that set into motion the Industrial Revolution, a revolution which toppled feudalism, um, kings and queens of Europe, and it ushered in the modern age. And when Newton unraveled the force of gravity, you know, here you have this new political shift that happens. Um, and now I just want to go to the next slide. Great, a bunch of text. So here we could start on the next slide. Thanks. Um, so here I want to just talk quickly about the um, electromagnetic revolution. So in the 1800s, um, we began to look into electromagnetic forces with someone called Michael Faraday, um, who discovered Faraday's law. And essentially what he did was, or what he questioned was, if I take a wire and I move a wire in a magnetic field, the magnetic field pushes the electrons in the magnet, creating an electrical current. And that simple idea unleashed the electric revolution. So if we have the next slide, thanks. And that's um, a drawing of Faraday during one of his Christmas lectures in London, um, which he would give to the public. Um, so a moving wire in a magnetic field has this uh, current that's created. And that's essentially why we have hydroelectric generators. That's why we have dams and can produce enormous amounts of power. And that's why people build nuclear power plants. All of it due to the simple observation that a wire moving at a magnetic field has its electrons pushed, creating an electrical current. Um, and just sort of moving further, if we take the next slide, Um, so essentially what this photo is, or what this image is, is of the inter internet, right? So the internet is a simple byproduct of the electromagnetic force. Um, the consequences of the electromagnetic revolution touch all of us. Um, and that is a picture of the Earth from outer space. And if you look at the picture, Europe is electrified, and you can actually see where there's economic activity, there's internet, and where there's no activity, there's poverty. So there's kind of wide-reaching cultural, social, political ramifications that start to occur here. Um, and if we have the next slide, Electromagneticism also affects things like medicine. So see, these are some of the things that one of the research teams I work on is looking at. Um, this sort of pill that has a chip in it, and the chip is smaller than an aspirin pill, and it has a TV camera and a magnet in it. So when you swallow it, the magnet guides the camera, and it takes pictures of your stomach and of your intestines. Um, and if we have the next slide. OK. So here's where we start to look at nuclear forces. Um, and I'm, I'm aware that we're sort of running short for time, so I'm just going to slightly rush a little bit through stuff. Um, so what I want to get to next is, if we go to the next slide. OK, so antimatter is what I want to look at. Because if we're looking at physics and we're going to look at the very core of matter, I think it's super interesting to also look at the question of antimatter. Um, so the nuclear force helped us to explain the secrets of the sun. And also what it does is it brings up questions of subatomic particles. So essentially, antimatter is the opposite of matter. It has an opposite charge. So an electron has a negative charge. The positron or an electron has a positive charge. And this means you can now create anti-molecules or anti-atoms. And anti-hydrogen was made at CERN outside Geneva, Switzerland, and also at Fermilab outside of Chicago, where they have anti-electrons circulating around anti-protons. Um, and at Brookhaven National Laboratory in Long Island, they detected anti 
um, helium and different notions of anti-helium, right? And what this means in principle is that you can create anti-people or anti-universes or anti-everything. So for every piece of matter, there's a counterpart which is made out of antimatter. And when the two collide, by the way, it releases the greatest energy source in the universe. Um, so the collision of matter and antimatter releases energy, which may one day take us to the stars. It's a 100% conversion of matter to energy by Einstein's equations, E equals mc squared. Um, so if we take the next slide, um, and just if we keep scrolling through, these are just some images of CERN and the actual like com material components of what these facilities look like, which I think are super fascinating. And the next slide. And the next, and the next, and the next. Okay, so here's where I just quickly want to go through, through string theory. So string theory is based on the simple idea that all four forces of the universe, gravity, electromagnetism, and the two strong forces can be viewed as music, music of tiny little rubber bands. So if I had a super microscope, I would look right into the heart of an electron and I would see a vibrating rubber band. And according to some physicist, um, Michiko Kaku, what he says is if you twang it, it turns into a neutrino. And if you twang it again, it turns into a quark. And if you twang it again, it turns into a different particle called a Yang-Mills particle. And essentially, if you twang it enough times, you get thousands of subatomic particles that have been cataloged by physicists. Um, and if you could get the next slide, please. Um, so they're not ordinary strings, right? They're not piano strings or violin strings, they're super strings, and they vibrate in hyperspace, which is a dimension beyond physical comprehension. Um, the world physicists live in as a theoretical, you know, as theoretical physicists is not quite the world that I think everyone else lives in because they live in a world that they consider to be 11 dimensional. Um, so we know physical reality is three-dimensional. We have length with height, and Einstein gives us time as a fourth dimension. But physicists believe that the instance of the Big Bang, the universe was not three-dimensional, not four-dimensional, but it was 11-dimensional. So string theory says that all subatomic particles of the universe are nothing but musical notes. So there's A, B flat, C sharp, and all of these correspond to electrons, neutrinos, or quarks, what have you. Therefore, physics is nothing but the laws of harmony of these strings, and chemistry is nothing but the melodies we can play on these strings. So the universe is a symphony of strings. It's a cosmic music resonating through 11-dimensional hyperspace, and that essentially is what um, string theory is. And this picture of bubbles represents the idea of something like a multiverse, which is something um, where when you have two universes collide, it can potentially form another universe, right? So when a universe splits in half, it can create two universes, and we think that is what the Big Bang is. So the Big Bang is caused either by the collision of universes or by the uh, fusing of universes. Um, so this gives you just a kind of overview of, of how we look at string theory. Um, if we can skip to the next slide, and the next slide. Okay, so some other things that I think are interesting to bring up are also notions of dark energy and dark matter. Um, so the thing I really wanted to bring, kind of mention, was that 73% 70 of the universe is dark energy. Um, and, you know, this is where I think physics has interesting relationships to questions of politics in the Anthropocene. And this is where people start looking at how do humans fit into the larger scheme of things. Essentially, humans make up 0.03% of the universe. Um, we, the higher elements, we are made out of oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, iron, and we make up just 0.03 of the universe. So, in other words, we're the exception. The universe is mainly made out of dark energy, and it's mainly made out of dark matter, um, overwhelming the stars, overwhelming galaxies. In fact, um, sort of our portion of what humans make up is, is quite small. Um, and I don't find that a depressing um, number. I don't find that a depressing fact. I actually find that really fascinating. Um, so if we skip ahead... And if we can skip ahead right to where we get to Pamela Rosencrantz's work. 
Okay, so really quickly, I'm just going to go through Pamela Rosencrantz and Magaly Royce's work. Um, Rosencrantz is frequently mentioned alongside speculative theories of sort of speculative realism and also different materialist theories. And um, interestingly enough, she's collaborated with Robin McKay and Reza Negrestani, both really interesting writers um, in these fields, whose texts both both feature in her catalog No Core from 2012. And I think her work raises challenging questions about what it means to be human in the contemporary world. She refers unsentimentally to her body as material and has spoken of a human and different universe. If we could have the next slide. So Rosencrantz's paintings, sculptures, and installations are informed by her extensive research into fields ranging from marketing to medicine to philosophy and religion. Critiqued as having been influenced by surrealist objects, she's filled, her, she's filled these branded water bottles with different flesh tone liquids, and she's clogged running shoes with similarly hued resins, transforming these everyday consumer goods into slightly uncanny sculptures. So her gestural paintings often are rendered with skin-colored pigments on metallic emergency blankets. So here we have kind of interesting references of body and material and sort of how you're displacing the two. Um, if we skip ahead to the next slide. So here's some more images from the No Core book of Rosencrantz, which I definitely recommend looking at. And the next slide. And the next slide. And the next. And the next. Okay, so this brings me to the work of Magaly Royce. Um, I wanted to show some examples from her exhibition, Highly Liquid, uh, which was shown in three stages. The first stage was a video in a landscape format of a larger-than-life body with no personal emotive characteristics, just a slow-motion shot of a body. And the video zooms in on the water or liquid as something tangible, right? So the physicality of it was evident. If we have the next slide. So here you see the liquid is used as a laminating device on the body or of the body. And the next slide, please. So the second stage here was a display case. Uh, the case was filled in an angle with inset light and layers of resin, which resembled water and ice cubes. So there's remnants of material processes and skin that looks like a fin, dead fish, shallow water, all depicted as a state between liquid and solid. Um, and if we have the next slide. And the next. So um, in the back space of the gallery were these flip seats, and the design was based on virtual models bought online that rendered fit that were rendered physical. Um, so these are objects that were never really meant to be rendered. They were really meant to exist online as these sort of blueprints. Um, and Magalie Royce said that she meant them to act as a sort of an act of virtual representation. Um, Royce, is, Royce uses color as a device to animate the objects and to give the seats multiple readings. Um, Royce created hand-hammered crutches with an industrial finish or a, a surface laminate, and this creates a removal of the personal touch, so it's beyond reach somehow, and it's an extension of the body, um, but a body that's not properly working. Um, the seats also reference public exhaustion or private moments. If we could have the next slide, please. Great. So um, if you could just sort of slowly scroll through the next few images of Magali's work, I'll just talk about them. So in, in Royce's exhibition at The Approach in 2014 called In Lukes and Dregs, she worked with refrigerators, referring to how they provide for our body. She also works with a series of pots called dregs, as you see here. The pots are handmade and labor intensive. Royce said that she wanted to make animated anthropomorphized object vessel-like containers with characteristics and with traits. They're shown in groupings, and the dynamics of the groupings are important to Royce. The title in Luke's refers to lukewarm, or the human body temperature, and they're often crafted with a powder coating finished with an industrial, industrial application of powder and then oven baked. Um, at the approach, the work was placed on a two-inch elevated platform of anti-slit material with a phenolic coating of sort. So the floor at the approach gallery is wooden, and with Royce's work, it places a reading of domestication on the work, and she wanted to avoid this altered reading. 
on the platform, Royce wanted to create a residual space around the edges, and that's where you see the image here of the kind of tubing with clips that occupy, kind of occupies a gutter space. Um, so you can see into the sections of tube, which are filled with water, sort of eating-related debris, and takeaway trays. So essentially, Royce's work is very labor-intensive. It's very handmade, and she tests out direct handmade processes, leaving room for accidents, which she says are unexpected and not seen in sourced works, which don't always allow for accidental qualities. Important to Royce is the inspiration she gets from the accidents and how it bleeds into her next series. Um, and essentially, I think Royce is interested in pushing industrial processes beyond their functional limitations, which in a way I think is um, slightly similar to how um, Channer and Barenboim kind of work as well. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, uh, thanks. Thanks, Dina. Uh, now we've got around half an hour to discuss some of the many things that were brought to the question. Um, well, I shall start by asking if there are any questions from the audience first. Or, uh, okay, maybe we can comment. Uh, Bart, would you like to pick up on something at uh, the moment? Or I can still absorb in the last. Uh, okay. The last <laughs> yeah. Okay, Bart is there. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'll. I'll start them and then pick up, right? Okay. Back to me. Okay. Hi again. Um, so, wow, yeah. <laughs> I can go in. Uh, yes, uh, many questions, I suppose. Um, okay, or do you guys have something to start with? Uh, as long as it doesn't process here. Milos, Nina, or Mara? Uh -huh. Yeah, as far as I can say, I mean, I would like to somehow uh, ground a few things within the context of what we sort of uh, made as an outline to talk about, which is maybe uh, the field of art, partially because this is my field of interest and this is something that I, you know, um, am very interested in and I can speak. Uh, this is a position from which I can speak and I think it relates very interestingly also to Nina's presentation. Uh, and how she uh, addressed this, also Mara, so maybe to kind of open up um, this subject of materiality and immateriality within the field of art would be a good starting point. Maybe. Yeah, I think um, something that struck me when both of you were speaking were some of these, or the notes that I made, were the kind of boundaries between animate and inanimate, material and material, and industrial processes and craft processes. And I feel like those are really core to how a lot of every artists are working today, um, or rather the concerns of a lot of their work. Um, and I was just interested to kind of hear what other concerns you thought artists were um, working with or approaching. Yeah, I guess uh, I can jump in there. Um, I think um, it's interesting to think about the question of here, uh, the medium, what happens exactly, somehow, like, uh, I guess picking up on Mara's, uh, the end of the talk where yeah, the question was that actually we, where does the subject end, where does the artist end, like, end and where does the object begin, and I think it's very perceptible in all the kind of practices here in, in, each in, in their own way. So I guess I, I would like to flow this just like a very well, broad question, but yeah, what is the medium before? Because of course in our field we are kind of, we have a long tradition of thinking that medium is very delimited and we know what to, you know, like you take a camera in hand and that's the medium. But now I guess with materialism, it's a much more expanded definition of medium. 
So yeah, if you have any thoughts on that, invite you. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking. I mean, I can pick up on a few traces. Of Mara, if you. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, what I, I can put a bit of a, a few footnotes forward of what I think uh, was really interesting to think about and to talk about in this context, uh, which also relates partially to my presentation, uh, which is basically two questions of who and where. So kind of finding a common ground within this flat ontology, as you described, Mirko, to situate the position from which to talk to, uh, from which to, to, to depart from, uh, and then find ways to branch out into several disciplines to find, again, ways to um, circumvent these categorization between disciplines, which I think is very much a post-human challenge. You know, how do we work, uh, how do we work across differences of categories? How do we work across differentiations of knowledges of science and uh, technology and art and how do these fields uh, combine, uh, how, how do they find a mutual platform to sort of exchange uh, views and knowledges. So in this regard I think uh, it's really important to sort of try and situate these uh, uh, two questions of who and where which eventually is a very impossible task at least for myself. So I think this, this notion of uh, the human and the environment uh, is very much a starting point of a material reality that we sort of inhabit if we if we pedal back uh, into uh, this notion of, of uh, the, the, the human and its environment and the organizing principles which are very much based on a material reality which have come which have uh, come to be put uh, into question I think uh, especially within the context of uh, you know the impact that digital technologies had on our lives. So I think this is uh, really a good and interesting starting point. And in regard to this, I think my interest is very much uh, indeed in this backpedaling in my presentation to this idea of the individual, the idea of the, the one, the, the idea of the one body, the singular, which uh, might. Uh, have its roots in the beginning of the Renaissance and so forth. So I think this is a very uh, interesting uh, notion that I can bring forward. And then, of course, to talk from here out on uh, to connect these issues to to other fields of art, maybe we can address later. I don't know if anybody would like to say something to this. Because I mean. Uh, what, I have a question for you. Sure. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, how do you navigate this, this notion of the eye? You writing this piece, um, but at the same time situating it in, yeah, in, in, in new materials thought, um, which is all about sort of decentering the author. What happens to the, the notion of authorship yeah, in I, the post-human world? I think this is a very interesting question. It's always a push-pull situation, I think, at least from my point of view. It is an affirmation and a negation at all times. So it, uh -huh. the challenge is always to work, you know, um, through this notion of authorship, but somehow you seem at least in my experience, it is always this gravitational pull back into uh, a system that sort of requires you to uh, function, whether it is you know, the art market, whether it is a sort of reality that we live by, which is very much partitioned on, and indexed on this idea of uh, the, the individual. Uh, so within the field of art, I don't know, I usually think it's very important to find a mutual ground from which to depart, uh, at least in a discursive way from, and how do we look and how do we contextualize and how do we uh, rearrange and, and question this idea of arts and for me 
it, it becomes very much about highlighting the prefixes that are attributed to art. So visual, the notion of visual in arts, I think, is a very uh, <sighs> problematic prefix in a sense that I do not, uh, or I find little, I mean, what, in, in the sense that everything has already become so visual and that this sort of aesthetics, I think, has been long since not an exception, but it is uh, rather the norm. So I think our reality is very much formed by aesthetics and formed by representation. So uh, from the point of view of being somebody who departs from art, I feel as if the tools that I'm supposed to, you know, put something forward with or this sort of language that I am working in is uh, having a certain impotence in the sense that it is already part of my environment and I cannot attribute a different uh, perspective to it. So I think this is very much a challenge that I feel and that I notice. And I think it's also very uh, related to uh, how representation and circulation induced by digital networks and technologies is uh, being used and what kind of realities it creates and what kind of realities it fractures in return. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this, this aspect of visual arts uh, I think is very interesting to the parts from at least within my practice and then find negotiations which brings me often uh, in my case to articulation to uh, text and language and uh, sort of other forms of expression that are not necessarily bound within the, the, the visual or within the representation, which I think um, hmm. I'm looking into. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if this answers the question of authorship. Probably not, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe it brings about... Oh, cool. mm -hmm. Can I jump in? Maybe I was thinking uh, you were thinking that in a way, maybe we can think about different models of, well, making art. Like so, like picking them from Nina's distinction between like four like principal forces of physics: say gravity, strong force, weak force, and electromagnetism, and how each of them actually has a very uh, special, uh, well, political implications as well, and, and actually ideologies connected with. So, in some sense, we could well, like in a very simplified way, claimed that a lot of the history of modern, modern art was about, well, gravity and strong force, I suppose, uh, some specific maybe gravity, and then maybe with this, like, over the last, in this period, and uh, most of the, I mean, the works we've seen now, I think that artists are somehow, what actually Mara calls, very this pull to be towards the center, where actually are the artist steps out or away, and especially, for example, just thinking about, for, like, Rosenkrantz or, or Royce or uh, Varenborn, somehow there is a sense of, of course, these are artifacts made by humans, but there is a sense of withdrawal, let's use this term, mm -hmm. somehow. And uh, But my question there, there always is, and, uh, can you really move away from the stage and how much, like, I mean, you know, how small the author can be, how tiny, how, how a big force can be. As part of this larger question, which I'm also dealing with a lot, is, like, how can we collaborate with non-humans or things or objects? Can we just step away? I think, um, I had... I, I think Something for me when I did these public labs, cooperative, uh, multiple people, multiple objects, multiple materials. And for me, I don't do, there is no hierarchy. Everything, every single object, everything is almost animated. Everything is alive, and I do not want to make any hierarchies. So I consider them all different. This is how I see it. And how I, but isn't that, isn't that what ontology is, is a non-hierarchical kind of space? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the things that were actually taking rocks as fully vibrant, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. But so, like, what, 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 how would you, you know, is it more about electromagnetism than some, I don't know, can we find new ways of model the world? I don't know, that's also for me question, because it's hard to really, you know, within our, like, still very modern ways of thinking and talking, you know, it's really hard still to see how, you know, uh, stone or crystal can be, you know, on the same plane, because we are still, like, yeah, I guess the notion of traction goes towards that, but, hmm. Mm -hmm. I like this notion of, uh, No, could you please reiterate that? Yeah, it, it's, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. She asked how do we simply deal with the institutions, uh, are they able to absorb uh, this type of research and because the institutions are quite conservative still, so what kind of strategies as artists and creators I suppose we can, we are using uh, to, to, yeah, mm -hmm. to penetrate the institutional arts with this type of research, right? Like, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I mean, I think it depends on the institution. Um, I have um, I have experienced a very big interest in in that kind of research. Um, I I mean, I wrote a master's at the Courtauld Institute of Art, which has the reputation of being a very traditional art history school, and. Um, and then I got, based on, on, on my research, I got hired by Stephanie Rosenthal to, for the Sydney Biennale because that was something that she was interested in to some extent. And now I'm doing a PhD with a German university who, uh, exact, like on, on these artists. Um, I think where, where, you, where, where art historians or where my professor, for example, expresses concerns is when you start um, as an art historian append, to append these philosophical theories to artworks without really having that knowledge of philosophy and this, this history where this philosophy is embedded in. So what I feel like is, is maybe important rather than claiming that you do work on a new materialist and object-oriented art, I think it's we are still in a very interesting stage where we can question these philosophy and where we can maybe question how certain question, certain um, theories or certain questions that rise out of the philo these philosophy can be fruitful to contextualize art. And that's my, my approach to it. Um, I would not say that Alisa Barenboim nor Alice Jenner are new materialist artists or object-oriented artists, and I think that's what they don't want either. Um, but what I what I find very interesting is to look in these overlapping areas of philosophy and art and and generate questions out of my readings of uh, these philosophers. That can I that not, that I then sort of pose. Uh, in dialogue with uh, to, through the artworks um, that I discuss with the artists that I'm working with. 
Um, so I think it has to do with a form of positioning and with a way of phrasing what you do in your research that can allow you to access uh, conservative in institutions. Mm -hmm. That would be my answer. <laughs> Are we still all present? <laughs> I think. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Where is Mirko? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could jump into uh, your remark, but it wouldn't be really fair to the person who asked the question. <laughs> Wait, Mika? I'm, I'm going to write him a message. <laughs> hmm. Well, I guess they are experiencing some technical difficulties. But, uh, since we are since we are live and we are online, there is maybe an audience that you know uh, is, is plugged in and it is anxiously waiting for the continuation of our uh, YouTube audience. Yeah, maybe. I wanted to um, get back to this idea of, the, of text and language in relationship to, to all of these theories, because I that is something that I've lectured about all year, and I think a lot of the students I work with find that really fascinating. Um, and even someone like Alice Channer collaborated with Kari Rittenbach um, for her mm -hmm. uh, Invertebrates show that was at Hepworth, Hepworth Wakefield. Um, Kari Rittenbach wrote um, yeah, poem, mm -hmm. um, which you can find online, and um, you know even someone like Marley Mull, um, who created last year the puddle pieces, um, which were written about um, in a lot of different articles or essays that referenced different types of materiality. Um, she has collaborated with people like Harry Burke um, on sort of different types of essays called Petrolia that reference the puddle pieces. So what I do think that is something that I find is notable and I find is really interesting or intriguing is this kind of collaboration uh, or exchange that's happening with artists, mm -hmm. um, with a lot of the artists that perhaps we're all looking at or are interested in, and how they're collaborating with writers or poets um, or even working with text in their own practices um, mm -hmm. in really interesting ways. So it seems to me that like critical writing or even cre rather creative writing seems to be um, going through a really important kind of transition with this type of work. And I don't know if it's because there's some sort of interesting interchange that's happening, um, if it's going back to the materiality of text, or even if there's just something about that this type of work that elicits um, a response via text, like creative mm -hmm. writing. Um, it's something that I definitely see happening. Um, yeah, I think this really this this idea of text and image. I think Mirko is back. No, uh, we should be complete again. <laughs> but uh, think this notion of uh, the text and image and this separation of text and image that have come to sort of implode in each other, in my opinion, is very interesting. Where it becomes very hard to draw boundaries where uh, between. A, a representation or an image and, and text. And here I particularly allude to the fact of how images tend to be uh, circulating and in which context and in what way digitization and digital technologies have influenced our perception of the world and our relation to reality mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that from the point of view of, of uh, information, an image is uh, essentially a code, and a code is essentially a language or a piece of text. So I think in this regard, language or text becomes interesting because it is uh, not a represented codification of a communication. Just as representation or an image is a way of communicating, it is essentially a, a, a way of uh, interacting, but it functions on different planes. And in this regard, I think it's 
this aspect of text and uh, writing remains really interesting, but it is still very much lodged within a anthropocentric or a human centered way of how we deal with language, how we communicate. It is very much a uh, definitive feature of the human, I think, mm -hmm. which makes it also uh, maybe even more interesting. Um, but definitely this aspect of, of text and image and this obfuscation of their boundaries is a tendency that I could totally agree with, um, whether it is from the point of view of the artist or the point of view of the theorist. Mm -hmm. It has become increasingly hard to, to, to find lines of separation between these two. Mirko, are we complete? Are you? Oh, no. <laughs> no, he left. It says he left the group chat again. <laughs> now we can have the after party. <laughs> Tequila! <laughs> I don't think Mirko's back. Yeah, let's see. We have, we can see each other, but we might not be able to hear each other. Mirko, can you hear us? Belgrade? <laughs> Well, great calling. <laughs> hmm. That's the agency of the technology <laughs> I'm talking about. <laughs> A gentle matter. I love both your presentations. It was amazing, and somehow they all fitted so perfectly together. I, I was. Is. I think they are having a, a conversation of their own over there, as far as I can see. <laughs> but, Maybe they can hear us, but we cannot hear them in return. Right, I'm going to type another message to Mirko. <clears throat> well, it's gone again. I'm going to put my little space picture back up, so bye, guys. No, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. My is on. I'm just taking my video off. Okay. <laughs> um, <Still here>. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Um, I think we got an extra viewer on YouTube. Maybe that's how they're communicating with us. Maybe. Nina, are you still here? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yes, uh, uh -huh. uh, well, then I'm just going to switch over to some questions that I have and things that I found interesting, or we can just start our own discussion here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I was very uh, interested oh, yeah. in... In your personal uh, relationship between how you, how do you marry these notions of science and arts? Because your presentation was heavily induced by a sort of scientific view yeah. and this notion of um, laws and you know this uh, sci a scientific truth of physics. And on the one hand, you also have you brought up clear uh, examples of artistic practices which uh, communicate on an entirely different frequency. So how do you, in your own viewpoint, in your own research, in your own 
way of thinking. How do you marry these two disciplines, if I can say? Yeah, so I guess um, for me, um, that was why I kind of briefly introduced um, the quote by uh, Ladyman in the beginning where he was talking about physics as being the ultimate science of um, matter. Um, so for me, I find a really particular connection with um, physics and the kind of fundamental forces of physics. Um, so there's a kind of a separation for me. There's the fundamental for basics of physics, and then there's the more kind of speculative theoretical side that I was talking about. Um, and I think what either do is look to the very fundamental core of nature, of, of matter, rather. Um, and that is, for me, what I find really interesting about some of the new materialist thinking, especially the feminist new, new materialist writers. Um, mm -hmm. Like some of the writing by Stacey Alimo and Anson Tawana, um, even some of the writing by Etienne Turpin, um, a lot of the recent writing about politics in the Anthropocene. Um, I find that connection of the reduction to the fundamental basis of matter really fascinating. So mm -hmm. for me, I see a really like strong connection with maybe the the ways that I politically enter some of these discourses. Um, and f there's also a number of different types of artist practices that I find really interesting or that I've written about as a writer or worked with. Um, and for me, the reasons I wanted to talk about Pamela Rosencrantz and Magalie Royce is because I think they're incredibly interesting artists that are working with different types of materiality in their work. Um, and again, like with Rosencrantz, she's someone who was included in um, speculations on anonymous material, uh, anonymous material show, right? She's like a part of all of these exam um, exhibitions, and her work is so heavily referenced as being part of this canon of theory. Um, and she kind of separates herself from it ever so slightly. Um, and it's not that I. It's sort of what you were saying, Mar. It's not that I can necessarily see. It's not that I can think about artists that work specifically with object-oriented ontology or with um, different types of materialisms. Um, it's more that I think some of the wider aspects of these theories um, can be perhaps um, considered when you're writing about the work in certain ways. Um, I've also seen lots of interesting curators work within their curatorial remits where they're looking at some of these philosophies and even someone like um, you know something like the last documenta where the director said you know I'm not directly influenced by these theories however I was actually looking more at the new materialist side of things or I was looking more at Karen Barad and things like this so there's a definite kind of interstices and connections that occur uh, however tenuous some may be and even then I find it really interesting <laughs> You know, even then, I find like, misinterpretations of theory really fascinating, and I find all of this stuff because uh, because.